Healthcare squeezes lawmakers from Ohio. ODOT responds to passenger rail skepticism and what movies should be shown in schools. These topics and more this week on Columbus on the Record. From the Battelle studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record, WOSU-TV's weekly analysis of the top stories affecting Central Ohio. Joining Mike Thompson this week, William Hershey, State House reporter for the Dayton Daily News, Karen Kassler, State House Bureau Chief for Ohio Public Radio and Television, Leah Sellers, Professor at Ohio Northern University, and Sandy Tice, Public Relations Consultant. Decision Day is at hand for two Central Ohio Democrats in the congressional health care debate. Both Mary Jo Kilroy and Zach Space voted for the House plan, but both, as of late Friday afternoon when we record this program, remain undecided, at least publicly. With a close vote expected possibly this weekend, both are playing a key role in this Washington drama. Karen Kassler, both Kilroy and Space face tough re-election fights. They're stuck between, I mean, it's really damned if you do, damned if you don't. Well, as you mentioned, as of right now, both are in the undeclared column. But I think most people here can agree that it's unlikely that Kilroy will vote against this, at least. Um, she's the one that is definitely in a closer race, at least if you look at the last race that she had. She won by, what, 2,300 votes. So if there were people who were upset with her then, maybe this would be something that we could swing it one way or the other. Zach Space, on the other hand, won by, you know, 20 points, 60 percent to 40 percent. There's a carload of Republicans that are vying for the chance to run against him, and certainly this is going to be an issue for him. Why isn't Mary Jo Kilroy just saying, I support this bill and remove the doubt? I have no idea. This one is a stunner for me because she's been a real progressive voice in the Democratic Party, has been for a very long time, has not been shy about it. Uh, Maybe she's trying to get some sort of a deal. Is it possible that the bill doesn't go far enough? I mean, I know that's one of the reasons that Dennis Kucinich had cited for his initial unwillingness to support it. But it might not, but if it goes far enough for Dennis Kucinich, (laughs) it would have to go far (laughs) enough for Mary Jo Kilroy. I think Sandy democratic genius that she is if she doesn't understand it i don't know i really it escapes me because she's not in a zach state space type district or a john bocherry type district up conservative in district northeastern yeah. ohio so i don't know this is a job killer we're talking about a one trillion dollar entitlement i don't see how any progressive would would uh, would vote no on it and frankly they'll they'll face the consequences in the election um, Zach Space, he said he came out. Now, it's, he was very uncoy. He said right after the House bill, I am going to vote no against this. It is going to hurt my constituents because of the Cadillac tax on uh, union uh, health plans. He put it in writing. Well, not a good move because now he can literally be called a flip flopper. But again, right now, as of when we do this, he is still undeclared. And, and maybe. He's trying to find a way to soften that a little bit and, and find a new way to express his reservations about it, but still vote whatever way he wants to vote on it. So, and he and other Democrats are looking back to 1994 when Governor Strickland, then Representative Strickland, Representative Fingerhut, uh, now Chancellor Fingerhut, voted for Bill Clinton's tax plans. And they both got a two year trip to Washington and then they were sent home. These people don't want to be sent home, but they're balancing two things. They don't want to hurt President Obama, who has made this a key issue in his presidency right now. They don't want him to look bad, but they'd like to stay in Washington. So it is a tough choice. Let's look at the debate on this. And An example of the debate happened this week outside of Mary Jo Kilroy's offices, where protesters from both sides gathered to say vote yes or vote no on the House bill. Let's take a look at it. How you doing, dude? No more freebies! You over here looking for a handout? No you're more wrong freebies! Town. If you're looking for a handout, you're in the wrong end of town. Nothing for free over here. You have to work for everything you get. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. This is America. No, 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 I'll pay for this guy. Here we go. Start a pot. I'll pay for you. I don't want a handout. I tried to. No, I'll decide when to get the money. Take over with 
500 words of this. Cuba. Leah, does a video like that have a, have a chance of backfiring and hurt the Republicans in this debate? Uh, we've been seeing a uh, video like this for the past year, in fact, with uh, some people in the party who... Uh, who have or are unaffiliated with the party who are angry about what's happening in Washington. And the, the fact is uh, we don't need a new entitlement program. We don't need something that's going to create unfunded liabilities for years to come. And people are angry, yes, but they'll take it. Uh, they'll take their anger to the polls, I'm sure, in did November. That, did that anger go too far in that clip? Absolutely. Most, most There's no doubt about it. Uh, what happened there should not, have, uh, should not have happened, but that's not a reflection on uh, the majority of people within the party. I think it's going to hurt the Tea Party movement, though. Um, the gentleman who was featured in there who was being ridiculed was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease 15 years ago. He is a retired professor from the University of Michigan. Uh, he's a nuclear physicist. He's very well credentialed and I'm sure that he probably contributed a lot more tax dollars than some of the people who were throwing dollar bills at him. That was out of line and that will cost people in that movement some support. Where does, where do, I mean you mentioned the anger, but where does this vitriol come from? Because I mean, there were people on the other side too, but not quite as as, as militant as that, well, but they were angry as well. With the town hall meetings yeah. back, I mean, this seems to be carrying over from the anger that we saw there in those meetings, and now it's going to these uh, these demonstrations and protests here. And that's a really good question. And it, it, the, I also wonder, is this representative of what's happening kind of in the middle? I mean, you've got people on either extreme, of course, who have very strong opinions, but what do most people here in the middle think, and, and which side do they fall on? Well, I think the people such as those who chided this uh, man, they see the health care thing as a sinister, even foreign plot to take over the country. One woman was quoted as saying, this is just like Germany's effort to take over Austria. I don't think most of the opposition is that way. I think it's more like she said. It's seen as a new entitlement that the government doesn't have the money to pay for. But for some people, it goes way beyond that. It There's certainly a conspiracy theory a conspiracy among some theory. people that it's it's the first step toward a number of dominoes falling to take over the government, like you but said. But the one thing to remember, and this is partly because I guess some of us, I am old, this is pretty tame stuff if you compare the protests of the 1960s. I mean, this is like, it's it's unpleasant and vulgar, but nobody was hurt, you know, except feelings. Uh, so... Bill, are you know. suggesting that it's your generation causing these, <laughs> <laughs> causing these <laughs> protests? Right. Well, I, I don't know. If each generation has its own uh, issues or idiosyncrasies, but that generation of which I was a part, the protests were certainly more violent than this by far. I think it's just ironic that the best video of that protest came from a newspaper. It is. That That's real. Great. That's a sign of the times. <laughs> All right, our next topic. The Ohio Department of Transportation has answers for Bill Harris, but apparently the Senate president is not yet buying the idea of passenger rail connecting Ohio's big cities. ODOC Director Jolene Molitaris met with, ha met with Harris this week and told him that, yes, a half million Ohioans will use the trains despite its relatively slow speed and less than optimal schedule. She said, yes, the freight lines will share their rails, and yes, ODOT can get it started for $400 million federal dollars. But Molotaris could not guarantee Ohio's share of the cost would not increase. Bill Harris, ODOT says it wants just $25 million to do the studies. That's all they want released now. Will Bill Harris go along with that? I don't think we should call him Choo Choo Harris at this point. <laughs> if the vote were today, uh, the two Republican senators on the controlling board, neither one of them will vote for it. And they haven't scheduled this vote on the state controlling board. So I think it's going to take a while. The Republicans, uh, Senate President Harris, thinks this is bad public policy. He, doesn't, he thinks this is something people won't use, that the state can't afford to pay for. And there's also another dimension to this. They love to embarrass Governor Ted Strickland, and he was out in the atrium like a cheerleader at Ohio State basketball game. He did go choo-choo. He was singing, I've been working on the railroad, and the Republicans <laughs> would like nothing better to put a spike in the track 
and make Governor Strickland look bad. I, d I disagree with you, Bill. I think it's really impressive that Director Molitaris has the clout in Washington to bring this money to Ohio, as she mentioned in her letter. It's a, it's a something she, it was a quite an accomplishment. But it's just a, 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 re a reflection of conservative values. And to me, this issue uh, shows the difference between progressives and conservatives. Progressives will take the money and run, and they won't think ahead about what unfunded liabilities there will be. Sure, we can build the tracks, uh, but we can we uh, can we uh, fund it in years to come, and it will be on the backs of Ohio taxpayers to do so. Of the 17 most populous states in the nation, two don't have state-supported or regional passenger rail, Ohio and Hawaii. Let's let Ohio join the party. The first $25 million is for planning and engineering. How will we know what's happening down the road if we don't spend $25 million on planning? But I Let's think see one what of the people problems according to Senate President Harris, he couldn't get the guarantee from the director that he wanted that if we spend this $25 million, does that compel us to spend the rest of it? And I think he wanted to know that before they took this first vote. And I think they're supposed to get back to him. I don't know when. He has some legitimate questions. How can you say, I don't want $400 million <laughs> in federal money for anything? I don't well, know. Well, there's the issue of you can build it, and there still may be yeah. some costs that would go beyond $400 million, but then there's the annual subsidy, and I think that's what's scaring a lot of lawmakers, because for public transit, in any system, buses, light rail, whatever, there is a public subsidy that comes along every year, and I think that's what scares a lot of lawmakers, whether that's you know, $17 million, which is the number that's been tossed around, or more especially given our budget situation it's that we're in right now. It's simple supply and demand. There will be demand for uh, maybe slow speed rail as this is, or high speed rail sometime in the future, and, and business will invest when the time is, uh, when the demand is there. What if the controlling board meets with the, and gas is three bucks a gallon, and all of a sudden, you know, it might not be a bad idea to take the train to Cleveland instead of paying three dollars for your SUV to get up there. Well, and look at during the snowstorms that we just had, when lots of people couldn't even get out of their driveways. I was driving to Cleveland during one of the bad ones. I, thank goodness, have a car that was good in the snow. But boy, it would have been nice to be able to hop on a train. But you do have like the main lobbyists for the Ohio Petroleum people here in Ohio who says that gas has really got to get a lot more expensive for people to really start thinking about setting aside their cars and doing something else. And, and all you got to do is look into downtown, drive downtown on a given day and look in, say, the State House parking garage and see how many people will still pay $3, $4, whatever it is to get in. But they still haven't given answers to some of the practical questions. When you get to Dayton, what do you do if you want to go somewhere else? Taxis, buses, other ground transit isn't there. And the other question, uh, if you want to go to a ball game in Cincinnati or Cleveland, do you have to stay overnight? Uh, those are questions that haven't been answered. And one of the supporters of this told me privately, he said, uh, you know, the routes really stink. Uh, and I don't, unless they can come up with some better answers, we I should think... should go t straight to Toledo? <laughs> maybe they should go straight to Toledo, <laughs> <laughs> into Lake Erie. Just by <laughs> The, the train, all of, is it All Aboard Ohio is the advocacy group. They said yesterday, well, it'd be great for school kids going to Wright Pat and also northern Cincinnati, the suburb there, I forget Sharonville. the name, Sharonville. They're already planning for this. They have a great ice cream store. It seemed to be a bit of a stretch that this was gonna, they're going to hang their hat on these two things. That well, that's why the marketing and that's why the early phase is going to be really important. We'll see where some of the holes are that we haven't identified on the front end, and it will allow us to plan down the road. And the marketing is going to be a key to this. And I've heard some people say that the marketing that ODOT's doing right now is not the best, that, it, that if ODOT really wants to sell this, that they've got to get more aggressive about making this attractive to the average Ohioan, or else it's just not going to get on track. All right, on that, let's get to our third topic. It's not in the daily headlines, but the state budget situation remains pretty dire. Even if the state takes in as much money as it has projected, it may still have to cut $8 billion from the biannual budget when it goes to do it in about a year. That $8 billion is the one-time federal money lawmakers use to balance the budget. And meanwhile, the Plain Dealer reports the special commission created last summer to find solutions to this budget mess has yet to meet. Now, Karen Castle, if they don't meet soon, they're going to start to give government commissions a bad name. <laughs> I'm sorry, is that possible? <laughs> um, that wasn't very nice. I apologize. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, th there are a lot of lawmakers who are very seriously concerned about this, who, who were looking down the road and seeing, 
you know, three billion, six billion, eight billion, whatever it is, this is a huge number that's going to have to be dealt with in as soon as, you know, 10 months when either Ted Strickland or John Kasich is going to be having to deal with this. And so none of these options are attractive right now. If, if, uh, if we don't get a big federal stimulus check, which is what Governor Strickland said he would pursue, you've got increased taxes, you've got spending cuts. These are really unattractive options either way. Yeah, do we see this solved before the election in November? Yeah, opinion polls are turning against Governor Strickland. Uh, people just don't have the confidence in his ability to uh, solve this crisis, and he can't rely on these one-time uh, one-time money from Washington. He just can't do it. Pursuing that is really a losing game. But what, but Republicans in the legislature voted for it as well. I mean, there was, back at the time, there wasn't a very, whole lot of option. Would, should he have just said, no, we don't want the money, like the trade money? Well, you know, he, uh, he also showed his uh, lack of leadership by switching his position on, on gambling and going after money that way. So, unfortunately, Ohioans are just losing their confidence in him. Uh, the uh, editorial boards of most of the newspapers in Ohio say he's failed. In his own words, he says he's a failed governor because he hasn't fixed school funding. Just lack of confidence at this well, point. Well, the problem in his is, though, that the Republican opponent of Governor Strickland seems to be waffling on his plan to save the state, to eliminate the state income tax. He was at the Dayton Daily News editorial board yesterday and was asked again when he's going to do it, how soon he would do it, and he said, wait until the fall. And that's a legitimate answer, but we will wait until the fall and we'll see what he comes up with, how he's going to replace this uh, nearly more than 40 percent of state tax revenue. Well, Bill Cohen and I interviewed him for our TV show, and we found a similar difficulty in finding an exact time frame for uh, eliminating the state income tax, which he, the best answer he came up with for us was once we change state government so that we don't have to rely on the income tax revenue as much, then we can cut the income tax. But, you know, it still remains a lot of issues of, of well, what agencies do you cut? Where, if you need to find these efficiencies in state government, where are they? These very specific kind of things. Sandy, you're working for the governor's campaign. Does he have to address this before election I in, don't in think November? He, I don't think he does. And I've been hearing about the structural deficit way back to the days when George Voinovich was governor. And I want to disagree that he is a failed governor. I think most of the newspapers are generally supportive of what he's trying to do under really awful circumstances. And the voters are blaming Wall Street and Congress for the situation that we face ourselves in. And Ted Strickland has the benefit of running against an ex-congressman from Wall Street. But when you look at neighboring states like Indiana, uh, who have a budget surplus, it's not just this worldwide global crisis. Uh, states can do it if they have the right leadership. And there was a national study done by Pew that looked at states in fiscal crisis. Ohio wasn't even in the top tier. So we're getting lots of high marks for doing some pretty strategic things under really awful circumstances. And the governor has said, at least when we interviewed him right after we interviewed Kasich, that there are options that he may consider if federal funds don't come in, assets the state could sell off or lease. He wouldn't specify, but he says there are options. Here's another option, topic four, something that has been promised to help the state budget. <laughs> is the expansion of gambling. This week marked the official start of the campaign to move the Columbus Casino. It's called Stand Up Columbus. It wants Columbus and all of Ohio to vote to change the Constitution to move the casino from the Arena District to the west side. Cindy Tice, you were worked to against this proposal back in November. I'm curious to get your take on this. What do you think of, the, of this campaign? I, I actually worked against the original casino yes. proposal. Um, I think this will win handily. Um, the casinos were very popular in pretty large urban centers where lots of people live. Cleveland and Cincinnati voted overwhelmingly for the casinos. And one of the things that this group has going for it is very concise, clear ballot language. If you know nothing about it and you walk in and you read it, you'll realize that this will do nothing to change the Cleveland Casino that voters wanted or the Toledo one that they wanted or the Cincinnati one that they wanted. The only thing it does is allow the one in Columbus to be moved. And Columbus didn't want it in the Arena District. So I think they're going to win, and they've got lots of good allies on their side. It's going to win, and so this will be great. All the rich people can move downtown uh, and have their high-rise <laughs> condominiums where the casino was supposed to be. And the casino can be out on the west side where they can exploit the people who can least afford to gamble. It's interesting to see how the leadership in the city has changed its position on the evils of gambling to the virtues of gambling as long as it's out on the west side. What was the alternative, though? I mean, the alternative would be to try to change the what had happened. Is that's what people voted for. Let them but build it there. But not Central Ohio. Central Ohio didn't well, vote for the it. The people of Central Ohio, did they secede from the 
<laughs> state? No, but Franklin County and all of the surrounding counties voted against it. And I think it's nice to have the local people have some say in where the casino is going to go. What do you, what do you, Leah, what do you make of the campaign, Stand Up Columbus, to Bill's point? I mean, Columbus did stand up, and they said, we don't want a casino. <laughs> it, seems to, it seems to me most people on this issue are in agreement. Uh, the city's in agreement uh, with the folks in the arena district, the property owners. And, and frankly, this kind of stuff shouldn't be in the Constitution anyway. Uh, locations of site locations for casinos should not go in the Ohio Constitution. What are the chances that rural voters, conservative voters, who principally are opposed to casinos, see casino on the ballot and, and say no? I don't think there are enough of them mm, to um, right. mm-hmm. counterbalance the strong support it has in Cleveland and Cincinnati and in Toledo. I really don't. Okay. West Side, here they come, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Our last topic. It's a controversy in many school districts, but in Marysville, the controversy boiled over in the past couple of weeks. It started when some high school history teachers showed parts of the R-rated Schindler's List saving Private Ryan and glory in their classrooms. Some parents complained, prompting a loud debate over district policy. They basically have come up with a revised policy that allows parents of high schoolers to opt out of showing or having their children see R-rated movies or PG-13 rated movies. Leah Sellers, should schools be showing these movies? Well, as a product of Marysville schools, I can tell you that kids don't watch movies in school all day in Marysville. (laughs) I think this is a great example of a great community rallying around the schools and the schools responding in kind. A group of concerned parents, legitimately so, are are concerned about what their their kids are watching in school and went to the school board and under the great leadership of the superintendent there, the school board uh, responded in in a way that was appropriate for, for um, for the circumstances. Should parents have, how much say should parents have over this issue and other issues? This kind of goes to books as well. I mean, you look at Catcher in the Rye and To Kill a Mockingbird. Someone's always going to be object, object to a movie or a book or subject content. I, I've seen all these movies, and I was stunned that parents objected to their kids seeing them. Um, Schindler's List was uncomfortable to watch, but it was based in history, and some of history is unpleasant. And I think kids maybe learn better sometimes when they see it in that venue than they do if they're getting it out of a textbook. Well, and I can remember the first time I saw Schindler's List was on television, regular broadcast television. They aired it with all sorts of disclaimers, but they aired the whole movie in its original form. And Sandy's right. It was terribly uncomfortable, but it was that visual representation in a story format really helped me to understand some, some issues, and I think a lot of kids would respond in the same way. Yeah, I mean, this is, these are just very graphic there's some nudity, especially in Schindler's List there was, as how the folks were treated, but there wasn't, it was basically historical, harsh reality, mm-hmm. basically. It wasn't Harold and Kumar go to White Castle or the <laughs> Hangover. I mean, <laughs> these, these are historical movies. educational in a totally different way, by the <laughs> way. You watched so, in your school, huh, growing up, fairly. <laughs> well, we had, we had reward movies, I guess. You know, if you sold enough cookies for the PTO or something like that. You've got a reward movie. But to your point about p- parents being involved, I went to a hearing about changing the law on teaching sex ed in schools, and there was a question that was asked of a sex educator, uh, you know, what about parents? Parents should have more role. And the educator said, well, you know, every year before we st- teach this class, we invite parents to come and learn about what we're going to tell the kids, and five parents will show up out of a class of 30 kids. So, you know, the parents that are concerned, the parents who turned out for this meeting, they absolutely should have the right to say, I don't want my kid watching this or whatever. But, you know, to get every parent involved might be a bit of a stretch sometimes. PG-13, should they be allowed carte blanche in high schools? Most of the kids in high school are over 13. Perhaps I don't some see why not. I mean, the Motion Picture Academy or whatever it's called rates those movies and they have a pretty tight screen on them. Um, my kids are big kids now, but when they were little, we carefully screened what they were watching and what they weren't allowed to watch, and I thought the ratings were always appropriate. Don't most high school kids go to R-rated movies by the time they're 17 anyway? Yes. I mean, yeah. But like you said, maybe choosing different subject matter. Well, some kids, they do, but there's a difference between showing them at school and your kids going to the R-rated movie. I think it's fine for the parents to uh, stand up and talk. Uh, I think the educators who and the school board who are elected should make these choices, and if the parents don't like them, they should vote them out. Or opt their child out, but the the concern was, Leah, that the, those kids would be ostracized. They'd be seen as, you know, nerdy or, you know... I talked to a good friend uh, yesterday whose child opt out, it opted out and said she faced no uh, such scrutiny. So uh, maybe, maybe some kids do, but there's all sorts of uh, that kind of thing going on in high schools anyway. Okay. 
Let's get to our weekly off-the-record comments from our panel. Final thoughts, predictions for the weeks ahead. Bill Hershey, you're up first. Don't forget to vote. Balloting starts Saturday at 36, state, uh, 36 sites around the state to choose a new representative for Ohio and Statuary Hall in Washington. That person will replace William Allen, whose racist views caused uh, state officials to bring him home. Top of my list is the Wright Brothers, the aviation pioneers from Dayton. You can also vote for them by downloading a ballot at www.legacyforohio.org, or you can vote for somebody else. Will they build, will they build two statues if they get in? Well, we'll see. Karen. There's three women on that list, too. I think that's kind of interesting. But uh, one of the things that is not being talked about a lot in the casino debate is something that Bill Cohen was reporting on this week, that the casinos are looking at the possibility of trying to uh, change the alcohol and liquor laws and maybe have 24-hour drinking at the casinos to keep our casinos competitive with those in other states. So that'll be interesting to watch. Bill Cohen from Ohio Public Radio. Leah. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't give me a lot of hope when I see our president trading a, a vote or trading, we're doing some horse trading for his health care votes. But I think he'll get his plan passed. But what does give me hope is uh, the high state Buckeyes and their chances in the uh, the basketball tournament, as well as the uh, OU Bobcats. All right. Um, I think as a result of the ridicule we've seen uh, aimed at the man who has Parkinson's disease outside Mary Jo Kilroy's office, the Tea Party movement is going to really tone it down and become a little more civil. And uh, if they don't, we're going to see some of their supporters start to back away and force them to be a little more civil. I hope so. All right. I went to undergraduate school at Syracuse, but graduate school at, Sir at uh, Ohio State, so I'm rooting for both teams, but my heart goes with my undergrads <laughs> at uh, SU. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. You can check out our website there. You can get a preview of our topics each week. You can get streaming video of all of our shows in case you want to Watch us not at 1130 at night during Pledge Month. Also, a link to our Facebook page where you can become a fan and a link to our blog. I actually posted three times this week. A new record for me. All of that at our website at wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew, for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.